four speakers, which is the last presentation for this morning section. He is vice chairman from uh, Indonesia Aquaculture Society 2019 uh, to 2024. Coordinator for Aquaculture Nutrition Network Indonesia chapter. Also, he is a lecturer in Jakarta Technical University of Fisheries. His research interests are covering the development of intensive shrimp farming system, evaluation of nutritional requirement for shrimp and marine fish, and facilitate the evaluation of novel ingredient and feed supplement uh, properties to enhance the growth and the health status of aquatic animals. I guess some of the audience definitely know who is this. He is Dr. Rumi Noridia from Indonesia. So the topic will be the development of plant-based diet in aquatic fish. Okay, Dr. Rumi, now it's your time. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes, very clear. Yeah. All right, all right. So I will share my screen right now. So I'll, hopefully everything is already there. All right. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, participants for this uh, very exciting uh, webinar from La Hanse. So my presentation this morning is about the development of plant-based diet for aqua feed. So I'll start my presentation today with the, you know, this, the graph that you oh, already Dr. commonly... Yes. Hello? Sorry to disturb yeah. you. Please uh, large, large your screen. You press, ah. press the button, yes. I think it's already there. I mean, I already zoomed it. Can you see okay, it? Okay, sorry. Please go ahead. Thanks. So it's already zoomed, right? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. So... I'll start my presentation today with the, you know, the common graph that we already seen in several, uh, you know, conference and webinar about the co global aquaculture fisheries and also the, the aquaculture production system. If you look at the graph from the FAO, we know that the capture fisheries is, go, is tend to be stable, like, uh, and the aquaculture is going to increase. So 2030, this, the World Health Organization and also the World Bank already estimate that uh, more seafood supply will be coming from aquaculture. So this is our chance. This is our time for aquaculture to make uh, the production become more productive and also more efficient. If we're talking about the fit for the total global aquaculture production system, we know that the, this is the, you know, the estimated global compound fit for the space, uh, important species like carp, tilapia, catfish, salmon trout, and also milkfish and also vaname. We look at there and the estimation, the need for the aqua feed in the future is around, uh, right now is about uh, 52.74 million tons in 2018. And this is uh, the, just the estimation for the aqua feed need uh, for, you know, until 2025 from the 2000 and 2018 with the average production rate around 77.7% .7 per year. So in 2025, to, in order to produce around 58.96 million tons, we're going to need around 69.57 million tons. So aqua feed is a very a good uh, business sector in aquaculture. So how to expand the aquaculture production in the, in the feed perspective, we need to decrease the reliance on the scarce and costly raw materials such as fish meal or dress fish, and also more research in feed formulation and alternative ingredients to replace the dietary fish meal. So by doing this, we can, we can hope that the production of aquaculture in the future is, will be more sustainable. What is the alternative for the, for the fish meal? We know that uh, from the previous uh, speaker and also presentation, we need to, uh, you know, several alternative ingredients can be used to replace the fish meal. There are soybean meal, cotton seed meal, corn protein, canola meal, and other alternative protein. But important is uh, for sustainability, the resource and also the environmental impact, social responsibility and economic viability of these uh, alternative ingredients must fulfill the sustainability criteria. If you look at the diet formulation in 1990, uh, more animal meal is included in the feed formulation, like a 69% and also 90%, only 90% plant protein source used in the diet formulation. Present time with the massive research, 
we know that 53% of the plant protein source is already used in the diet formulation. It's only 31% of the animal milk used in the, in the diet formulation. But in the future, we need to replace more. We need to substitute more the use the, the inclusion of the animal meal. And we expect that 69% of the plant-based protein source will be utilized to replace the animal meal. And in order to have a very good uh, aqua fit diet in the future, we still need the novel ingredients and also the, the binders, the you know, to, to enhance the nutritional value of this uh, uh, aquatic uh, feed that uh, formulated with the plant-based protein source. We know that uh, among the alternative protein source, soy protein is uh, commonly used, but the wider use of the soy protein may be hindered by the negative effect associated with the presence of the anti-nutritional factors. We know that the protein has inhibitors, there is a lectins, there is a phytic acid, saponin, phytoestrogen, antivitamins, and also phytosterol. There are several anti-nutritional factors that contain in the, in the soy protein that can inhibit the utilization of the nutrient in the soy protein. So these anti-nutritional factors, they are responsible for the decreased growth performance, the decrease of the fit efficiency, Probably there is a histomorphological change in the distal intestine of some species of fish, and probably there is an alteration in the serum biochemistry. And consequently, for the processing technique and proper blending to improve the nutritional quality of the soy protein or plant-based protein is needed. Right now, there are several uh, advanced soy protein that are available in the market, and we know that uh, two of them is there is an enzyme-treated soy, and then there is also fermented soy. The enzyme treated soy, they, are, they use the combination of non alcohol extraction process and also the enzymatic treatment to produce the advanced uh, soy protein. And there is also the fermented soy, they use the microorganism to degrade the macromolecules to low molecular waste, so, in, uh, so make them become more uh, digestible and also easy to, easy to utilize and absorb by the aquatic organisms. Here, I just want to give you the, you know, the comparison between the nutritional value of the soy protein, the conventional soy protein, and also the advanced uh, soy protein that can be utilized in the aqua feed diet formulation. So if you can see the crude protein here, for the conventional soy protein, there are around 42, 43%. We know the enzyme treated soy with this enzymatic process, they can increase the nutritional value, especially in, in terms of the crude protein, up to 62%. And the fermentation process can also concentrate the protein up to 52.87%. We know that the moisture also decreases uh, in the advanced soy protein compared to the conventional soy protein. And also the crude fat is, is being increased and crude fiber is also uh, somehow is a comparative. So if we just discuss uh, first about the enzyme treated soy, we know that the function and benefit of the enzyme treated soy, they have a highest digestibility of protein and amino acid compared to other uh, conventional product. And the protein was hydrolyzed to peptide before extraction, so it can be absorbed rapidly. They have uh, extreme low anti-nutritional factors compared to the conventional soy protein. And they can, the, the enzymatic process can remove the soy antigen and also the oligosaccharides. And most economical when replacing the conventional high protein source like a fish meal, blood plasma, or soy protein uh, in the diet formulation. But if we're talking about the functional uh, fermented soy protein, the function and benefit, we know that this fermentation process can also degrade the soy immunoreactivity and they can have a lower levels of the anti nutritional factors. They can decrease the molecular weight of the soy protein. They can improve the nutritional quality and also the fibrinolytic enzyme activity of the commercial soy protein and also could partly prevent the alteration in the intestinal and also the liver morphologies in some species of fish. So to, in order to see what is the effectivity and what, how, how, how efficacy of this uh, two advanced soy protein, we have a research to evaluate the fermented soy protein as the partial or total replacement of the soy protein, the conventional protein in the practical diet for Florida Pompano. So the objective of this research is to evaluate the several inclusion levels of the fermented soy protein to replace the conventional soy protein. We look at the growth performance, we look at the serum biochemical characteristic, and also we look at the intestinal and also the liver histological condition. So this is how we formulate the diet. So we, if you can see on the slide here, we partially and also completely replace the use of the soy protein. We, we would like to see 
whether this fermentation process can also have the effect have effect to the health condition of the of the silver pump panel we will get the the diet formulation so all the diet formulation have a comparable uh, proximal analysis uh, value so here we have a four treatments and three replicates we have we put the 20 pump panel per tank and also egg week growth trial and feeding strategy at four times daily we adjust the ratio based on the percentage of body weight after two weeks sampling period and we also measure the water quality to support the you know the the carrying capacity of the recent uh, growth trial we can see that the water quality do not have any significant impact and all within the acceptable range for the for the pump panel and if you look at the growth the growth trials uh, interestingly there is uh, statistically there is no uh, effect to the to the growth performance compared to the uh, when we partially and also completely replace the soy protein with the uh, with the you know fermented soy protein and but we can see that the, in the in the histology if we, if we compare the conventional protein there is a heavy inflammation in the intestinal condition of the pump panel if you look at the, the the fish that fit with the fermented soy protein the the condition is more better compared to, to the conventional soy and there is no heavy inflammation and and also there is no uh, gra uh, granulation compared to the compare uh, basal diet the control treatment if you look at the liver condition we in the in the in the basal diet in the control treatment there is a heavy lipid accumulation in the liver but when we feed them with the fermented soy protein the condition of the liver is going better and even even i i would i would like to say there's a not so many alteration in the liver condition when we fit the fish with the soy pro with the advanced soy protein in this case in the fermented soy protein so the summary for this research is the fermented soy produced uh, by fermentation process using the aspergillus orize and also the bacillus may serve as a good source of the protein for the for the pump panel as the inclusion of the fermented soy to replace the soy protein increased the diet were able to partially prevent the development of bug histological alteration in the liver and also the distal intestine of the Florida Fompano. So we need to, you know, we need to, uh, for the research, we need to evaluate in the long-term uh, culture period, probably from the stocking, stocking uh, period, stocking size, until they reach the consumption size. So this is what we are doing right now. We still evaluate whether the fermented soy protein economically still provide a good uh, economical cost for the farmers in order to increase also the productivity and also to, to, to have a very good profitability during the production system. So next, we, we also would like to evaluate the use of the another advanced soy protein, what, what we call as the enzyme-treated soy. So the objective is to analyze the effect of the parcel and also complete replacement of the dietary fish meal with various inclusion level of the enzyme-treated soy on the growth also on the whole body composition, serum and enzyme activities, and also the histomorphological condition of the liver and also the distal intestine of the, of the Florida Pompano. So this is how we formulate the diet. If you can see in the, in the slide, we have a two trial here. In the trial one, we replace the use of the 15% of the fish meal, and we uh, gradually decrease the inclusion level of the fish meal from 15%, 12%, 9%, and also 6%. And the trial two was designed based on the results from the trial one. So in the in the trial two, we still have a decreasing of the fish meal inclusion levels from 12% to 6%, 3%. And the last diet, we completely replaced the use of the fish meal with the enzyme treated soy here. So there's a, for the characteristic of this research, we have a two series of the growth trial, four treatments and also three replicates per trial. We have also 20 pompano per tank, and we culture the pompano for eight weeks with a feeding strategy four times daily. And also we measure the water quality as the supporting for the carrying capacity of the tanks during the growth trial. So again, we can see that the, for water quality, we, we are still within the acceptable range for the Florida pompano. But we, if we look at the final weight, this is uh, interesting because a fish meal still have a uh, you know, a good source for, 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 for nutrient. We can see here, as we decrease the inclusion level of the fish meal, we, uh, we also observe there's a decreasing growth uh, performance for the pompano. And also for the weight gain and also for the thermal growth coefficient. And also for the FCR, as we are decreased, we, as we are trying to decrease the inclusion level of fish meal, 
we also do not do not see any efficiency in in FCR. Even when we try to replace the use of the fish meal with the advanced uh, soy protein here. So we from the trial two, we also observe a consistency result. When we are trying to decrease the inclusion level of fish meal, we also observe a decreasing in growth performance of the Florida pompano. So this is, uh, you know, the relationship between the final weight and also the thermal growth coefficient to the replacement level of the fish meal in the both trials. We can see here when we are trying to decrease the inclusion level of the fish meal, we also experience with the, with the you know, decreasing trend of the final growth and also the thermal growth coefficient in the, in the trial. So this is uh, the serum back chemistry, but, uh, but also the nice thing, the, the most interesting is uh, the use of the enzyme treated soy is almost similar with the fermented soy protein. Also do not cause any significant impact to the distal intestine and also the liver condition of the, of the pompano. Uh, we can see that uh, they are still better, but when we are trying to replace more uh, in fish meal in the diet formulation, we also have the inflammation in the distal intestine of the, of the pompano. So the summary for the second research by using the advanced soy product, like the enzyme treated soy, the continued reduction in fish meal levels will likely reduce the growth performance of the pompano. And in this study, uh, the enzyme treated soy protein could be used to substitute dietary fish meal without compromising growth, nutritional, and also health status of the pompano. And further research, again, we, we still need to evaluate the efficacy and also the effectivity of this advanced soy protein in the commercial condition, meaning that we need to culture the fish from the stocking size until, until reach the consumption size in the, in the long-term growth period for the, to get the, you know, the, the complete analysis for the use of the enzyme treated soy. So next, uh, I also would like to discuss about another, another protein source uh, the DDGS, we know that this is uh, the, the production of corn in the United States. They also produce the distilled grain solubles with this uh, uh, extraction process after they get the ethanol and then the, the, the waste, the distilled grains, and then they, they distill it again and then also, also get the, what we call as the DDGS. So in order to evaluate the growth performance of the DDGS, uh, we also have a, a research with the shrimp with a little penis vename to partially replace the use of the soybean meal. We use the three levels of the DDGS, 5%, uh, 10%, and also 15% inclusion levels of DDGS to replace the use of the soy protein in the, in the diet formulation. And all diets were formulated to contain approximately 36% protein and also 6% lipid. And all experimental diets were produced at the, one of the commercial feed mill here in Indonesia. We produce it with the PT Suritani Pamuka, Java Group Aquafit Research Center. And the growth diet were carried out at the, in Batam, Indonesia. And this is uh, in the right side. You can see the, the diet that produced by this uh, feed meal by using uh, several inclusion level of DDGS to partially replace the use of the soy protein in the diet formulation. And this is how we, re, uh, how we formulate the diet formulation. We use the three levels of the corn DDGS. 5%, 10%, and 15%. We also reduce the, the soy protein here, as, as you can see on the slide, from 25%, it, it's going down to 225 20 and 17.5%. And we also supplement the lysine because when we are trying to replace the soy protein with the corn DDGS, we know that the lysine cannot fulfill the, you know, could, could not satisfy the requirement for the vaname. So we, we also make a supplementation with lysine here to just make the nutritional value uh, comparable with the basal diet by uh, utilize the 25% soy protein in the diet formulation. So this is the proximate composition of the diets containing various levels of distilled grain, grain solubles, DDGS. You can see that uh, we, uh, we determine the, the diet with the 36% and all the, all the diet have a comparable value here. Also for the crude fat level, they have a comparable value among the dietary treatment. So the protein contents of whole stream body were analyzed by combusting according to the Dumas method. So this is the profile of the amino acid composition of the experimental diets. So if we look at the three limiting amino acids like lysine, threonine, and also the methionine, we can see that this is ha they have a comparable value. 
And this is uh, also interesting that uh, when we're trying to replace and we substitute the use of the soy protein with the, with the DDGS, the methionine level is going to increase. And also for the lysine, they have a comparable value here, uh, more or less around 2% in the, in the diet formulation. And also for the threonine, they also have a comparable value uh, among the dietary treatment. The growth trial for this uh, research, we have a uh, four treatment and 10, 10 replicates. We uh, stocked the, the aquara tank with a 15 stream with average initial weight of 1.04 gram. And we stocked in the more or less than 100 liter aquaria tank for 52 days of the culture period. And the feeding strategy is a four time daily with assumed FCR around 1.5. And also the pH dissolved oxygen, we measure all the physical quality, water quality, and also the, the water chemistry but weekly and also daily for the physical uh, water quality. And this is the result for the water quality, all still within the acceptable range for the lithopenis vaname. And this is for the response of the juvenile. We can see that uh, almost uh, all the treatment do not have any significant difference. Meaning that when we're trying to reduce the use of the, the expensive ingredients like a soy protein with a, a cheap ingredients uh, such as uh, the DGS, they also do not have any, uh, you know, significant impact to the growth. They still have a have a uh, similar growth compared to the control treatment, as long as we blend them with the proper blending uh, formulation and also we supplement them with the proper uh, nutrient. In in this case, is we know that the with the using the using the DDGS, it will lack of the lysine. Then when we supplement the lysine, then we we have a, a comparable value here. So in the future. The crude protein level is not uh, is not as a baseline, but how we determine the quality based on this uh, specific minimum requirement, especially for Vaname. They are continuous feeder and they, we, we need to fulfill the specific nutrient requirement in order to get the optimum productivity and also profitability in the uh, stream culture production system. And this is the proximate composition of the whole body of the stream. Uh, value represent the mean of the 10 replicates. We can see that the, in terms of the carcass, the body carcass, all the stream have a, a comparable value in terms of the crude protein, water content, fat, dry matter, and also the ash content in the, in the diet formulation in the, in the stream. Uh, as the conclusion for this research, under the condition of the present study, the DGS can be used up to 15% to partially replace the use of the soy protein and wheat flour with the compromising the growth of the Pacific white stream uh, lithopenis vaname. And economical in terms of the cost per unit of protein, DDGS is a very promising alternative to be used in the diet formulation. Further research need to focus on the mycotoxin issue and long-term effect on the use of the regular protein DDGS in stream culture system. We have uh, we already done this in the in the in the long-term uh, growth trial period and we can we can we can see that, that there is a consistency result that there is no effect to the growth of the faname when we're trying to culture the stream from the PL7 from 0.03 gram until they reach the consumption size around 25 gram in the, in the, in the pond culture condition. We already published this and then it's uh, easy to, to, to Google it uh, to get the, the data for the long-term trial of this uh, DDGS uh, as the alternative protein to replace the use of the expensive protein. In this case, is a soy protein. So for the general conclusion for my presentation today, uh, we know that Pompano has wide tolerance to the soy-based protein and also the under experimental condition, the use of the enzyme-treated soy, the fermented soy protein, and also the GS for, for the shrimp could be used as an acceptable protein source to replace the fish meal and also another expensive ingredient such as the soy protein in the fish and also shrimp diet formulation. And the combination of the enzyme-treated soy with the 4% spirit reset probably to replace the protein meal and also prevent the decrease in growth performance. So thank you for the opportunity to say my talk to Lei Hanse uh, and I'm ready to receive a question if you have. Thank you. And I give it back to Benjamin. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation, Dr. Rumi. Okay, so this is a great talk. You have conducted a lot of uh, research on the soybean meal. Okay like the replacement of the common soybean with the fermented soybean meal. Later, we have one question from our audience and also replacement of fish meal with enzyme-treated soybean. 
Also, you have done some research on DDGS in shrimp feed venom feed. Okay, thanks so much. Let us move to the question. Okay, the first question, I think, please explain the industry method for further production of fermented, fermented and enzyme soybean meal. Uh, Dr. Rumi, please. Ah, Benjamin, say it again. Uh, what is the question? Okay, for so explain the industry method for produce uh, fermented uh, soybean meal and the enzyme treated soybean meal. You mean in the industrial level, right? Yes, so, yes. So right now, right now, yeah, right now the the use of the fermented soy already utilized by several commercial feed mill because they know that this is uh, what we know that the several feed mill they they produce the functional feed and they use these uh, ingredients as a part of the functional feed production system. So functional feed meaning that we need to include uh, as functional ingredients or functional additive in order to enhance the group performance and also the health condition of the aquatic organism. So this is this is make the functional feed difference uh, compared to the conventional feed, uh, Benjamin, because this uh, the functional feed can, can help produce the superior uh, group performance, but we know that the uh, farmers always thinking about the cost, economical cost of the diet. But please look at the results. Please look at the results after we use the functional functional feed. We look at the survival rate, look at the productivity, and look at the you know the profitability. Then we can we can see that oh there is no significant uh, increase in terms of the feed cost if we use the functional ingredients or functional additive in the diet formulation. Thank you, Benjamin. Yes, yes, I fully agree. We must say the growth, the production, this is the most important part because the farmers buy the feed, they want to get the high production. Okay, the second question, I think just now you mentioned that you are going to do the further research on replacing uh, soybean milk with DDGS. But at the meantime, you are facing the mac macrotoxin problem. So any solution to overcome the, the problem of uh, uh, macrotoxin? Yeah, so the, the thing is uh, with the uh, proper production process right now, Benjamin, the mycotoxin is already going to decrease, you know, and also for the a better production system, we actually can minimize the mycotoxin problem. With a proper storage uh, system, uh, we know that the, all, all the all the feed will facing a similar problem if we store them in the long period, uh, Benjamin. Then we, if we're thinking about to how to store the feed in the proper way, and also I think I think mycotoxin is not a, is not a big issue in the stream industry, but the thing is, uh, yeah, there are there are a limitation also Benjamin. There are, there are a maximum inclusion level that can be used in the diet formulation. So in our research, fifteen percent is okay, but probably more than fifteen percent you you're gonna have a, a problem with the mycotoxin or you have a problem with this. Uh, you know, uh, also the the in the in the in the in your feed machine, probably you have a problem with a sticky sticky diet or or something like that. But yeah, please uh, maintain the proper blending system, a proper uh, formulation in order to get an optimal productivity by using a DDGS. Yes, I see, I see. Yeah. Because uh, if I'm not wrong, I saw some papers, you know, from. Uh, Online ICI papers, they mentioned the mycotoxin is very, very harmful for the hypertrophic of shrimp. That's why this question, right. I, I ask this question from you. You know, the yeah. hypertrophic increase is very simple, but the most important gland for the shrimp. They have four types of uh, cells and easily and very fragile, easily to uh, damage by the mycotoxin. Okay, the third question is very long generally. Let me go to the question, try, try to understand the question first, using some you know, shrimp farm, where I will be benefit it together with it. I think later maybe this question, we will reply to you <laughs> after, after the webinar. And uh, can change the meat color by using DDGS. So that means that when we use some DDGS in the feed, will, will the, the, the color of the shrimp or the fish the meat color will be changed. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question, Benjamin. We also have the organolytic test here. 
uh, when we try to use the more inclusive level of the DJS, yes, uh, I'm talking about shrimp, Benjamin. The yeah. color, when, when we boil them, when we boil the shrimp, the, the, the reddish color is tend to be very fast compared to the, you know, conventional diet. So they are more reddish, they are more reddish. But if we if we trying to, uh, if you use a more inclusion of the DDGS, yes, they are, they are, the color is not uh, quite good. But if you use the proper inclusion level, and then you can you can also increase the quality of the shrimp with the brightest color, with the reddish color on the shrimp when we try to boil the shrimp, and this is good. So the DDGS can actually decrease the the, the economical cost, the formulation cost of the aqua feed, but at the same time you can also increase the quality of the shrimp by using the DDGS. But please, not more than you know, don't don't use it in the you know more inclusion levels. So, so our recommendation is. Uh, don't don't exceed the fifteen percent inclusion level. Okay, so so I think you answer another question already, which is right. uh, uh, is it uh, the DDGS can up to fifteen percent? I think just now your your answer already uh, from your research. Okay, I think we have last questions for you, Dr. Romi. All right. Because uh, a lot of questions will come in later. We can communicate the question. Is uh, some farmers okay? Uh, sometimes doing fermentation to their regular shrimp feed. Is this method helpful to increase the digestibility rate of feed? Okay, that means they buy the commercial feed. Then, then they do some fermentation in their farm. Is it helpful yeah. for the digestibility? I Your think the question? I think the goal for the farmers doing this fermentation process in the farm with the commercial feed is to uh reduce the macromolecule you know to, to degrade the macromolecule into micromolecule so the so the nutrient it become more easy to be absorbed utilized and digest at the end of the when when we end this fit when the shrimp fit the the fit with this uh, fermentation process and also i think the fermentation process other than to degrade the low the the molecular weight also to concentrate the protein level so I think this is a two main purpose of the farmers doing this fermentation process before they feed the shrimp in the in the in the farm. So they are they are really want to uh, provide a, a good source of feed, and also when the when they provide a uh, ready to be used, ready to be digest, ready to be utilized, ready to absorb a diet, they can expect a, a good growth of the shrimp in the in the in the farm. Okay, okay, I fully agree because in China, we also have a lot of, uh, you know, feed mill in that factory, they, they produce the commercial fermented feed for the shrimp, for the fish. Yeah, okay. some powder, some pellet. Okay, so later you can do more discussion with Dr. Rumi. Since we have uh, five more minutes, so I have one question, one more question, last question, <laughs> Dr. Rumi, okay? Yeah. I choose one question. So have you ever experienced a color, this color, color, this color when using DDGS for substituting for mm -hmm. shrimp feed? So have you experienced, have you ever experienced a color, uh, sorry, I didn't get this point, the color discoloration when using DDGS for substituting for shrimp feed? Oh, so, so means, yeah, I, I can see on the on the question and answer tabs. Wait, uh, this wait. is coming from Mr. Nilo Cordero, right? Have yes, you experienced yes, right. a color discoloration? So discoloration, I'm. I don't think I have an experience on this uh, discoloration, uh, Benjamin. When I use the DDGS for substitute, because I normally uh, make a recommendation to the feed meal, five to ten percent DDGS can be used for uh, to replace the use of the expensive protein like a soy protein. And I never had the experience on this coloration. So I, yeah, that's my answer. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rumi. Okay, hopefully we will see each other in future, face to face. Right. Okay, thank, thank you, thank Dr. You. Benjamin. Thank you good so day. much, uh, everyone. Have a good one, have a good day. Thank you. Good day to you, All right, bye bye. I think now we move to Dr. Uh, Mr. Actor. Mr. Actor. Uh, Mr. Actor.
Mr. Akhtar, I think a few questions for you. Are you there? Okay, uh, sorry, maybe we wait the uh, minutes where we can call him. Hello. Hey, Mr. Akhtar, okay. Yes, yes, please, sir. Okay. Yes, I sir. Of, yeah, I, I think a few questions for you. Let me check. Yeah. I don't hear that. Give me a minute. I checked no, the no not problem. so many questions. Uh, no problem. <laughs> about 30. About 30. Let me check. Huh? No, no problem. Yeah. I'm always ready for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and also thank you for our audience. Okay, the first is uh, uh, the first question, uh, Mr. Akda is yes, uh, dear Akda. Yes, Good please. to know that Bangladesh got the FAO higher ranking from fish production. Okay, if I'm not wrong, last year your production is around 4.6 million tons. Right. Okay, the fifth top five country. Yeah. Okay, is this, uh, is this solid in local market only or it is export to international, to other countries? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, very. Uh, very good and inquisitive questions. Uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh uh, has got good progress in uh, fish production. That's why FEO uh, pointed it out uh, in ranking. Uh, it is especially for a, 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 a inland water capture uh, feed and as well as a culture feed for tilapia. And that's why in tilapia, it has a uh, ranked uh, fourth in the world and third in Asia. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, there are so, so many ponds which are not used to culture uh, 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 tilapia and pangas uh, scientifically. So it is increased vertically, you know, in the same area, they put uh, more fish fry and they took the technology and some sort of a quality feed. And nowadays, a feed meal producing floating fish feed. You know, in tilapia, why there is a big change? In our country now, uh, less amount of sinking feed in tilapia is used. Uh, most of the feed for tilapia now, floating fish feed. So uh, practicing feeding them, a uh, type of feed has already been changed from sinking to floating. So tilapia production has already been increased. And you know, uh, some uh, good quality brood fish uh, has already been imported from other countries. So a uh, change, changes in a uh, good quality fish fry uh, if in contributed a lot to uh, this production. Uh, I, I, a few years ago, it was dip, depression in inbreeding depression. Uh, so less production. Now in the same area, we are getting more increased production. So that's why if you ranked uh, for this uh, culture of uh, fish, uh, it has been uh, in the uh, third position in Asia. You know, it's a good news for tilapia. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think I'm glad, glad to hear that. Hopefully in future, maybe you can come to the fourth or third, please. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the second question. The second question is, is it also the problem and the challenges for fish feed formula in Bangladesh? Okay, the utilization of local raw material, utilization of local raw materials to use for local fish production because of quantity and the quality of local produce raw material. Yeah, uh, very, uh, yeah, 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 very, very good, good question. I think it is from a nutritionist. You know, in Bangladesh, there is a bad practice uh, because they are not following the government uh, standard parameter. I have already given you the idea that government set up some parameters of uh, crude protein percentage, fat percentage, 
and other uh, per sentence. So, so very important per sentence is uh, how, how, how much per sentence of carbohydrate I mean, energy, how, how much percentage of fat, how much percent of CP? This is the standard set by our government. But we are not following this one to get it least cost fit formulation. So we are considering low quality uh, raw materials, which is available in Bangladesh. But we don't know nutritionally how it is OK uh, for uh, fish and how much digestible it is. And uh, there are some adulteration also in, uh, in true sense. Uh, uh, to be honest with you, uh, there are some suppliers, they don't know uh, wh uh, what will be the quality for uh, fish feed raw material. So uh, adulteration is happening there and the storing capacity is not good enough. Uh, uh, for an example, rice polish, ran city, right? You know, pure, pure rice polish, very rich in fat. Fat is very important. So fat will be easily digestible to get more energy. So we don't know how much it will be preserved and in what way it will be preserved and within the stipulated time, it should be used. We don't know, but supply are giving us uh, as a low cost uh, solution. So that's very important. If we consider the low cost ingredient, we have to consider what will be the feed additives to be incorporated in the feed formula to get the feed safe for fish. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, thanks for, uh, for your sharing. I think uh, there is uh, plenty of the jobs for the researchers, for the experts like you need to be done in future. Okay, so let's move to the third question. The third question is, uh, what are the basic uh, considerations while formulating floating feed and uh, sinking feed for carbs? Oh, yes, good question, because uh, to get more fish production, especially for uh, uh, fish feed. Uh, nowadays in our country, what is being practiced, you know, uh, when, when uh, fish are very small, they're using some sort of uh, powder, nursery powder that is a, a floating uh, type powder. So uh, when the fish is, is small, so uh, floating of the fish feed is very important issue. So for floating fish feed, uh, what should be considered? Considering issue is that uh, low bulk density. So what type of ingredient will be used? That should be low bulk density. I mean, it's not, it will not be easily uh, uh, go to the bottom. So it will keep sometimes uh, within the uh, range of the water uh, to feed it well uh, by the fish. So this is very important issue and it should be uh, oil coated. So uh, to use oil is very important issue here. Uh, for, for sinking feed, you know, uh, for sinking feed, if the uh, mixed culture of the uh, fish, I mean, uh, not so uh, intensity of a specific one species, uh, then uh, a sinking feed is not uh, good enough. Uh, so for a uh, sinking feed, uh, some feed will eat from the uh, top of the water and some uh, middle of the water and some uh, bottom of the water. So for sinking feed, if it is go down to the bottom, some fish will uh, eat this uh, fish. And uh, third one considering issue is that for sinking feed, binding capacity, binding capacity and gelatization, gelatization, binding capacity and gelatization of the carbohydrate is very important issue. And floating fish feed, oil coated is very important issue. Uh, these two uh, parameters are important issue to preparing a floating and sinking feed and the, uh, considering the ingredients also issue. Uh, uh, the reason is that low bulk density ingredient will be used for floating fish feed. Okay, thank, 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 thanks for your answer. One more question. The feed formulation based on the ideal protein it's used to reduce the cost of diet for, and uh, it's, it's used to reduce the cost of diet and the environmental pollution in poultry feed. Okay. okay. So why this method doesn't, didn't apply in the fish feed formulation? Oh, very, very good question and environment friendly uh, friend question. I appreciate him. Uh, asking this type of question, you know, we, we are always for uh, protecting our environment. Okay, okay. in poultry, we are using uh, some sort of uh, 
enzymes, especially uh, protease enzyme to get all the proteins uh, or uh, best amount of uh, protein will be digested. That is very uh, an issue. So uh, for a phytis enzyme, it is a considering issue. If we don't uh, utilize the uh, phos phosphorus, so uh, you know phosphorus will be coming out through feces in the nature and it's not good for environment that is being practiced in poultry so for fish feed you know if we don't if you don't use any protease enzyme so protein uh, undigested protein will come out and it will be in the uh, pond and then you know uh, uh, amine uh, just uh, from ammonia it will be converted into a uh, nitrite nitrate is very toxic you know and the bacteria will uh, uh, ferment it to get it nitrate. Nitrate is very safe. So uh, why should I go for toxicity in the pond? So that should be the considering issue to utilize a much amount of protein, which will be in the feed uh, to avoid uh, environmental pollution in the water and uh, to reduce the uh, phosphorus, uh, I mean phytic acid to reduce the phytic acid, phytic enzyme is, uh, using phytic enzyme is the issue for protecting our envir environment. Uh, so that's why it is being practiced in the poultry feed. So uh, I uh, rather I would suggest that a good question, we should use uh, phytic enzyme, uh, protease enzyme, and sometimes considering the ingredient, we should use dialanase enzyme also, but there is a question we should ask the supplier whether it is thermostable or not. If it is not thermostable, we can get it after pelletization or after uh, extrusion. Uh, if it is thermostable, we can use it before pelletization or before extrusion. These are the critical area. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, uh, Mr. Agnar shared a lot of information about, about this question. Okay, I think one more question, Ms. Agnar. Yes, please. As far as we know, uh, Bangladesh started farming the tiger prawn. Whether there is some uh, venomous farming, can you explain? Uh, could you explain some uh, shrimp farming in Bangladesh? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, like the production, uh, like the species, like the, the diseases and the feed, uh, whatever. Please. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, 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 very good, uh, very good question. You know. Uh, especially for uh, shrimp feed in the coastal area, uh, uh, they are uh, they are producing it, and price is very high. Also, uh, uh, it's profitable business if there is no uh, a, a environmental uh, uh, risk or a disease risk. You know, in our country from the very beginning, uh, uh, it was less prone to viral diseases. You know, less less prone to viral disease. Day by day, it has increased to prone to viral diseases. So it's a big challenge to minimize the viral diseases. So that's why we are advising them, you have to consider the uh, water condition because you know, high, high hot temperature, temperature is high and the water uh, density, dip, depth of the water is not uh, up to the mark. Then automatically uh, shrimp will be getting stress. And that can lead to uh, their death also. Uh, that's why pond management is a big issue. Number one, we are uh, 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 promoting this pond management. And uh, for uh, viral, uh, viral, avoiding viral disease, uh, nowadays, uh, government has uh, uh, got some idea that uh, it should be uh, viral, uh, virus-free, uh, uh, fry so that's very important virus virus free fingerling that's very important that is uh, the priority uh, issue so number one challenge is uh, pawn condition uh, farmers actually don't know how to uh, manage pond and how to manage a pond according to the variation of the temperature uh, that's very important issue here in bangladesh and uh, number one uh, feed also uh, there are so many anti-nutritional factor. Uh, some feed mill owners, they don't know, they don't have exact consultation with the uh, appropriate uh, uh, experts uh, to minimize the anti-nutritional factor. So all the times, shrimp are uh, vulnerable to prone to diseases. So diseases a uh, problem and the pond condition problem. 
uh, and uh, traceability, you know, traceability. Traceability for developing export market, government try to get minimize the traceability, how it will be produced uh, from uh, production to suppliers and leading to export market. Uh, there is a chain, that change is uh, uh, monitored by our government authority as well as uh, uh, farmers uh, uh, got some instruction. These are the uh, SOP. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to uh, export this uh, shrimp and prawn. Uh, uh, that's uh, the considering issue. And nowadays, it is being increased to get uh, quality shrimp and uh, prawn production in our coastal area and government supporting them uh, financially and providing extension services, I mean, technical services. Okay, that's, that's good. I think in future, between China and Bangladesh, we can communicate anytime. Yes, 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 communicate, I know. Yes. Yeah, for, for the shrimp farming, you know, from uh, extensive, intensive, super intensive, our density can up to 1,200 per square meter, so which is uh, pretty high. The production high. per square meter is uh, 20 kilo. It's, uh, it's incredible. Yes, super intensive. And uh, I think uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Mr. Akda, for your drawing, sharing so much information. It's quite useful and helpful for, for, for ours, for all the audience. I think uh, now we're coming to the end of morning section. So uh, again, thanks, big thanks to all the presenters and also audience. Our afternoon section will start from 2 p.m. Beijing time, okay? Hopefully we will see you again in this webinar. So enjoy your lunch and uh, have a good rest. Yeah. See you, thanks. See you. Th yeah. Thank see you, you thank you all uh, for enjoying the webinar and uh, interacting with each other for the betterment of the industry for all of the countries who participated in the webinar. Thank you. All right.